Hey, I've got 12 o'clock. Everybody ready to go? I'm going to ask some of those of you who have not turned on your camera to turn on your camera. We want to see your face. Typically, we'd be down the hall in the, the Commerce Center having poppy seed chicken and hash brown casserole about now. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that today. You can dream about it since it is lunchtime and think about it. But unfortunately, you'll just have to do something else for lunch after this uh, on your own. And there might be a place where you could go get that. But that's kind of our traditional BEP meal uh, when we've had our meetings in person in the past. But I'm so glad uh, to be able to be bringing back a BEP meeting today. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sandra Wilson, uh, president of the Paducah Chamber. So we're thrilled to get to have a joint venture today between the Chamber's Business Education Partnership, our BEP, and our Small Business Committee. And our sponsor for today is the McCracken County Public Library. And I believe the library has come into their own even more so uh, during COVID-19. You guys have certainly delivered in every way possible resources to our community. So um, we're, we're gonna hear more from them in just a minute, but we're thrilled to have them as a sponsor for this uh, event to feature some of our new innovation programs in our community. Um, so these involve our schools and some new and exciting entrepreneurship opportunities. And I'm so excited about all of, all of them that I just wanna share information about them every day. So the program today will feature information about Sprocket and Codify, the first 50K tech business recruitment program, the Youth Coding League, which is active at Clark, Morgan, McNabb, Heath, Lone Oak, Reedland, and Paducah Middle Schools. And the Paducah, uh, or the McCracken County Public Library is also a sponsor of the Youth Coding League, which is an after-school enrichment program. So there again, we see the resources provided by our library. Before we get to the program, I want to introduce the 2021 board chair of the Paducah Chamber, uh, Dr. Anton Reese, who also is president of West Kentucky Community and Technical College. Dr. Reese. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, President Wilson. I uh, want to uh, thank everyone on behalf of our board of directors uh, for you participating in what will no doubt be a very informed and engaging presentation. Definitely want to uh, thank uh, Terry Lundberg, uh, Chair for BEP, and Jessica Newman. Uh, this joint effort uh, really is timely. I, I ref reflect very quickly on uh, ongoing conversations about ways in which we can engage uh, our youth and, and retain them. And certainly uh, a lot of the information that will be shared today, and particularly as uh, Sandra noted, the list of schools uh, and that age group, uh, this is both timely uh, and important. Uh, to our efforts uh, here in Paducah. Uh, with that, I will uh, yield the microphone back and uh, look forward to hearing uh, this is great uh, uh, information from uh, both uh, Monica and Dr. Stapleton. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Reese. Um, just a little bit about the Business Education Partnership. It was established over 20 years ago with a mission to develop collaborative partnerships between businesses in the community and our education providers, and also to become a proactive voice for educational issues at the local, regional, and state level. The Chamber's Small Business Committee was established about a, a year ago, maybe, maybe approaching almost two, and that was to add additional focus by the Chamber on our services and resources to, to small businesses, and the committee that we have serves as a resource for the, us as the chamber to give us ideas about what small businesses need. So on the call today are Terry Lundberg, our vice chair of the chamber's workforce and education, and she serves as chair of the BEP, and Jessica Newman, vice chair of the chamber for small business. So thank you both for joining us. And you know what, Terry, I didn't ask you if you wanted to make some comments, but um, if you want to unmute, you, you can, or you can just wave me off. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't see Jessica on the call right now. She may be joining us here in a few minutes. But before we start, I wanted to note that WPSD, a local six, is live streaming this call. They've been a great partner with us uh, through this time of pandemic to make sure that all of our programming gets out into the community. We're also recording the call and we'll post the recording later on the Chamber's website and Facebook page in case you want to watch it again or share the video with someone who could not attend. If you have questions during the, this event, you can enter those in the chat box or email me at swilson at paducahchamber.org and we'll handle those a little bit later. 
So as I mentioned, the McCracken County Library, Public Library is our sponsor. They've been a wonderful asset and provide great resources. So the Interim Library Director, Sarah McGowan, is joining us today to speak on behalf of the library and to introduce our program. Sarah? Thank you so much, President Wilson and Dr. Reese and all of our, everyone for joining us here today. Um, what I, I really appreciate the shout out for our pandemic performance. I think the library really was able to step in in a lot of ways The um, pandemic exposed a lot of gaps uh, for access for people. And I really appreciate our staff has been really talented and really flexible and worked really hard to step in there. And as we all know, this going forward, workforce development will be even more important. That's, and we are, we're that in our community. Um, we're really excited to work with Sprocket and so excited to hear more about the Youth Coding League today. So um, Sprocket announced a formal partnership with Codify of Cape Girardeau in August of 2020. And together, these organizations are launching and developing economic development programs aimed at growing the digital economy, training workers, identifying seed funds and developing tech-based businesses. Over the past four years, Codify's investment, workforce training and programming have resulted in the creation of 50 startups, 180 jobs and $40 million in investment in the Cape Girardeau area. So you can look forward to some of that coming our way. Um, Sprocket will replicate some of Codify's programs such as the first 50K program here in Paducah. Sprocket recently launched the West Kentucky Innovation Challenge in partnership with Codify Kentucky Innovation and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, they will award up to $200,000 in innovation development service grants for um, five small businesses or individuals. So let's welcome our speakers today. There's people that I'm very familiar with. We have Monica Bielak from uh, Grow West Regional. Um, she's the Grow West Regional Director. We've been working with Monica for a good long time now on lots of projects. And uh, the founder of Sprocket, Suzanne Clinton, as well as uh, Dr. James Stapleton, the Codify co-founder. So Monica, are you gonna take it away? I am. I have to say, I have missed all of you so much. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of an overwhelm, so I'm going to take it down a notch, but it's so good to see my people and to talk to you and just know um, what a great community team we have. So it's, it's great, and it's been such a long time, so I wanted to catch you up and get you a little bit up to speed because um, I think last time... We talked, we were uh, having all of you in um, the boiler room at the Coke plant, which is the Sprocket home. And I am not the screen sharer. So could somebody pop up our um, uh, Stapleton? Do you have that? <laughs> He's nodding, <laughs> it's coming. So awesome, thank you. So, um, and I wanna just let you know, So. When I talk about Sprocket, I like to call us an innovation lab because I feel like we're always just being a catalyst for something new. But in practical sense, we're an economic development nonprofit and we bring together people and programs and expertise so that our community can really thrive in the digital economy. And that is a passion that I've had and I've enjoyed doing it with um, uh partners like the Innovation Hub and the Kraken County Public Library. This is one of our very first um, programs um, in, in the Coke plant. And we were coding with music thanks to a Google grant that the library got. And um, it was fantastic. So um, we're, 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 you know, getting out of the beginnings now. We're really starting to grow. And um, and moving beyond just those processes and programs that we helped with the Innovation Hub. And what happened as a result of doing those processes and programs of the Innovation Hub was that a bunch of adults showed up and um, we needed more space, more ability to expand their interest and their needs. And their needs had been to be a lot about business and innovations in business. And um, it just so happened that um, the state had come around, the, uh, the Cabinet for Economic Development and their Office of Entrepreneurship, and they were looking at what we were doing and they said, we'd really like to one, empower you and to challenge you to take this up a notch. 
And so with their support and their um, financial um, help as well, we started on a journey to build out space that is called co-work space. And this is a model that we saw Codify our partners doing in Cape Girardeau. And it works well for collaboration and getting um, people together and helping um, keep the synergies and in, in new tech enabled companies going. So we got on this journey to build out the space at the Coke plant. And there's um, thanks to the city of Paducah, we have received a forgivable loan and we are starting our construction in about four weeks. So very cool things are happening in that um, space and we're really excited about it. But then COVID hit, right? And so we had to make some reprioritizing of what we were doing as well. And so right when that happened, we really put our heads around three big buckets of work. And that is has to do with not only our space, but training people for the digital economy and then attracting companies that would then hire and build out in our community. And so that's where we brought in Codify to come and really provide the expertise and um, the know-how. And I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Stapleton now, who is gonna just dig a little deeper into what it is we do and how we're rolling out our programs this year. Thanks, Monica. Sorry for the awkward pause. I, I know that everybody knows I was chasing the unmute button. So uh, it's a pleasure, uh, Sandra, and uh, everyone to be with you uh, again today. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, help uh, really connect some dots around some of the activities that you've uh, been hearing about and provide some of the background really on um, sort of how Codify got to this place, and then specifically uh, all these new programs that are really rolling out and the impacts that you can plan on them um, creating in, in McCracken County and West Kentucky. So we started six or seven years ago at Codify, um, really with the recognition that many rural communities, uh, not just uh, here in our region, but across the uh, central part of the United States have really been left out of the digital economy. And with it, um, really driving economic development and growth around the country and across the world. Um, we sort of pulled from our backgrounds as entrepreneurs in the software and internet space and started looking into models that we could develop with programs that we could pair together um, really to try to achieve our collective goal. And that is to just drive economic growth in our communities. And the bedrock of that is obviously high quality occupations for the folks that live in our communities. And so we, we were um, uh, started out just kind of building these, this model piece by piece. What you'll hear about today are some of the programs that we're deploying uh, in Paducah, McCracken County and across West Kentucky. These are programs that we've built and tested over the last five or six years and not by happenstance, are sort of uh, in this model that we've created that sort of connect both supply for talent. So being able to help um, our education and training partners in each region uh, really inject new talent uh, into the digital economy, uh, demand for that talent by being able to attract and help build more technology-based companies. And then the connectors, the spaces and networking uh, and educational events and competitions that you've already seen some of uh, across Paducah. And so um, we're working on a variety of strategic projects. And in fact, there's several projects that um, we're engaged in actually outside of our own region. Um, but these uh, primary projects are really driving our work in connecting Southern Missouri with uh, West Kentucky. Uh, we have aspirations to create um, really a, a, a region that goes across multiple states in the area that we can connect resources and really leverage uh, the development of these digital economies. And certainly our uh, partnership with Sprocket and everyone in your region uh, is a big part of that. So let me start first talking about the Youth Coding League. Um, as you saw in our model, we have this learning work component where we're just 
We're just thinking long-term about how we get more people in our communities engaged in digital work related and, and learning. And so at one point we really uh, decided we needed to step back and think about our youth. And uh, many of you that are involved in education and in business education understand uh, the ongoing uh, desire to uh, really integrate more STEM related concepts and to expose young people uh, to more of those subjects. And, and obviously then at some point, perhaps uh, vocations. And that's exactly what the Youth Coding League was. So we created it and really just launched it about two and a half years ago um, to, to provide an after school option for students to be exposed to computer science. Uh, the entrepreneurs that uh, are the partners in Codify were all software uh, folks. Uh, that's what uh, our expertise is really in. And so we know how difficult it is, especially um, for certain families to provide access to the youngsters um, in addition to the education system to provide some awareness about what code is, what software is, how it's developed, not just playing with video games, but actually how you develop the code that actually makes them work. And so it's a fifth through eighth grade program that um, allows us to do that. I'll talk a little bit about the program and, and then there's a lot of detail on these slides I obviously won't review that you can come back to. But um, the first thing that we did was look for a curriculum. We partnered with Google who has a curriculum called Computer Science First. And we basically took um, this platform of theirs, which is a sort of multi-thematic use of a uh, language called Scratch, a coding language for young people, actually a uh, research-based uh, language that was created by some folks at MIT and Tufts University years ago in an effort to try to break down the resistance from young people in getting into syntax-based coding. Let's be honest, uh, adults don't like syntax-based coding either. There's a whole new revolution uh, going on with sort of no-code software development. So, um, but this sort of block-based uh, coding makes it really more interesting and, and fun for students to be able to build logic and, and be able to build uh, processing uh, without having to write the language. And so um, we basically built a youth sports team orientation around that after-school activity. So there's a regular season, we call it. You'll pick up on all these old sports themes. There's a regular season uh, that goes on for um, several weeks. We use uh, sprints, they're called, which is something that's uh, a discipline based inside of software development. And during those sprints, students are learning uh, skills. They're using video and virtual based uh, curriculum to sort of build the coding skills that then they start to apply in projects, very hands-on uh, project-based curriculum that manifest into a playoff season. So those of you who've been involved in uh, McCracken County in the last year or so might've gotten uh, interested or involved in cheering on your local team. There were some teams who uh, were actually doing very well uh, in the playoff. Um, the playoff series is actually just a way to, to make uh, really the learning more exciting um, to pull the community together. I'm looking at this photo and you probably realize based on the photos that we have a thing for big trophies. Uh, <laughs> my, my business partner, um, who really it's his intellectual property that, that this whole concept was based around, uh, just, just loves small people with big trophies. So, so we have a lot of fun in giving away prizes. Um, and, and as students work through the playoff series, um, there's obviously a little, a little competitive nature, but we also try to reward uh, good work and improvement by uh, all types of students. And there is a technical merit award that we actually have uh, professional software developers who uh, review the code the students write and, and, and then make those awards. So uh, the league just started a couple of years ago, as I mentioned, we're in five states uh, with a um, about 55 uh, teams across those states. And we're working on a project to actually expand the Youth Coding League across the country. So one of the things we look forward to um, in the future is to be able to work with a partner that we have called the Center on Rural Innovation and be able to actually uh, plant uh, Youth Coding League teams in communities and regions across the country 
that they're working on. Many of these regions exactly like ours, uh, facing some challenges in sort of redirecting our economies and more to uh, uh, along the digital path and the need to really get more and more young people involved uh, in this education. So uh, we're really looking forward uh, to that in the future where students in West Kentucky could be competing against students in, in Springfield, Vermont in the uh, championship round of the playoffs in the Youth Coding League. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, we're super thankful for the McCracken County Public Library and stepping up uh, very early on and investing in additional technical education um, that goes beyond the great stuff that they do there at the library in supporting the Youth Coding League. Here you see a photo of the McNabb Elementary students. Um, as was mentioned by uh, Sandra, uh, seven teams uh, in the community now. And uh, we are uh, talking to a variety of communities outside of McCracken County in West Kentucky and even across the state in East Kentucky. So we think by next fall, there'll be more Kentucky competition uh, ongoing. So let me uh, sort of transition here from uh, your thinking about how we get more and more young people uh, really working with software technology. And let's talk a minute about our adult training program that um, we're super excited to be launching uh, actually in about four weeks, uh, this front end uh, web development course that's part of a two course 12 month program will be launching uh, in Paducah. In fact, uh, applications have been going on for a while. Uh, this is a program that we started about five years ago in Cape Girardeau because frankly, as we started to build more companies and attract more companies here, we didn't have enough software developers. And if you talk to the folks at CSI and other companies around uh, West Kentucky, uh, this is a problem that exists globally. So uh, it wasn't just a Cape Girardeau problem, it's also a problem in West Kentucky. And so uh, we decided to, to develop a program that would really get individuals access and on a path to get started and enter this occupation. Uh, the training programs of this type, in my view, are not an end all be all. Uh, but they do, in a very expedient, efficient, hands-on way, get individuals to a place where they can really test their aptitude and then um, begin employment and start to work um, their way towards, you know, sort of a, a longer-term career development plan, which would include additional education and training uh, at uh, West Kentucky Tech and at Murray State and other education providers as time goes on. Um, the program has been extremely successful. Um, it is um, obviously our response to this growing industry. Uh, one of the reasons that we're excited about software development being the focus of the companies we work with and the workforce development program is the demand in these occupation drives extremely high quality salaries. So if you look at the averages between um, all of the average occupations in Missouri or Kentucky compared to those of software developers, that picture probably tells its own story. I will tell you, working with software developers every day, um, salaries because of the increase in demand that seems to be projected for a long, long time into the future, uh, really continue to grow. So individuals who can get started in this occupation that we can build a community around uh, can really change the trajectory of their lives and their families' lives. And, uh, quite honestly, that's that's what our mission is all about. Uh, we were able to attract a substantial amount of funding um, about six months ago from the Delta Regional Authority of Federal Agency, working directly with uh, Sprocket on a co-application and then a uh, Department of Labor grant. So uh, about $1.7 million that uh, manifest into a three-year project. And it's pretty simple. We, we really want to expand the, the delivery of the program to more communities, uh, both in, across Southern Missouri and West Kentucky. Uh, these um, give us the opportunity to work with education providers to, to sort of build education and training uh, pathways that will help individuals move beyond these uh, entries into these occupations. And then obviously connecting those individuals to employment opportunities. Uh, we recently had conversations with employers in the area. And one of the things everyone's most excited about is there's a large amount of support to uh, 
sponsor both capstone projects that are provided by local employers and ongoing paid apprenticeships that go beyond the training. So we're really excited about being able to get people that finish the training on their way to success in, in the early days of uh, their new careers and occupation. And like the Youth Coding League, we're working on expanding this across the country. We'll make some announcements in the future about a national network that we've created where individuals who get trained in our local communities will be uh, basically in a marketplace that allow them to seek employment not just locally or regionally, but across the country. And part of that system is the sort of um, support that we wrap around um, those individuals as they complete our training program. And I don't have a lot of time to go over sort of the qualities of the program, but if you wanna look into this information, um, we, we think we've built the perfect kind of training program for folks in rural communities. And we know that because we've been working on it for a long time. We, we really rely on professional software developers to provide the training and support. There's a lot of experiential learning involved. It's all hands-on. Employers provide these amazing capstone projects in both the front end and back end parts of the full stack program. And so by that engagement by local employers, uh, it really gets it really gets the individuals who are in the program off to a, a wonderful uh, start. And the outcomes and outputs of the program are going to be, um, as you can imagine, with the investment substantial. Hundreds of people will complete the training, um, will uh, be able to work in paid internships, uh, creating new jobs, and 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 even uh, helping some folks who are looking to take a graphic design or another technical related uh, career and sort of elevate themselves into software development. So those individuals will obviously be able to connect to uh, this national network that I talked about and be able to work remotely in some cases, also be able to work for local companies. Um, and uh, then a part of this model is the way that that supply of do, new talent actually engages with uh, local companies, some of which will be new that will be uh, relocating into Paducah. So I wanna talk about this first 50K program that Sandra mentioned in her opening comments. This is a program that is not different at all than a lot of economic development programs that are designed to recruit or attract a company to relocate into uh, your community. We've been doing this for four years, um, maybe five years now in Cape Girardeau. And um, the idea is really to recruit a company that is in the early stages. I, I will tell you that these software companies, as the years have gone by, we're able to attract companies who have are making great progress, who are, um, you know, generating revenue who um, aren't in sort of the idea or product development phase. Uh, these are companies that are really scaling and it's our job um, while they're in Paducah, uh, working with uh, partners in the area to do everything we can to help the businesses accelerate. And we focus really on increasing revenue, um, really uh, trying to connect the companies to local companies, partners, and individuals who can help them grow. And then those companies go on to create more and more employment in the community. And the more success that we can have helping them grow, um, obviously, the more we can uh, recruit other companies to go along with them, sort of starting to build a new cluster there. Um, and if you think about the broader regional impact, um, it provides great investment opportunities for individuals uh, who are looking to do that as well. And so I wanna put that into some context for you in terms of economic development and economic impact. So last year in Cape Girardeau, we went out and successfully uh, recruited four companies. Uh, many of you got a chance earlier uh, in, in uh, several months ago to meet some of these companies at an event that we had in Paducah. Uh, you got a chance to meet their founders and find out what their products are about. and. So the question comes up a lot is, you know, really what, what's the value of this kind of program uh, to the community? And so we worked um, with a local university partner to actually 
um, use a very uh, well-known economic impact modeling uh, package. And basically what, what we're able to do by relocating a company is create uh, immediate significant economic impact that I think probably uh, exceeds what most people would think. Unfortunately, over some period of time, startup has become to be a term that's almost anonymous uh, with um, synonymous with small business. And uh, those aren't the kinds of companies we work with. These are high growth companies. Uh, these are companies that don't want to be, um, you know, the next corner store. Um, and we need a lot of those businesses and we want to continue to help those businesses. But these are companies who can really um, have substantial economic impact. So these four companies are expected based on that modeling to create uh, nearly $1.3 million of total economic impact. And from the 15 jobs that they're relocating, they'll create another nine for a total of 24 jobs. And obviously uh, that kind of impact drags along uh, a local tax implication as well. So for a moment, think about several years from now, when we've re, uh, relocated several companies from uh, several cohorts of the accelerator and how that annual economic impact begins to grow. We're in our fifth year here. Um, the 2019 accelerator cohort here was fantastic as well and are growing. And so this is a program that you'll um, see a launch of in April. We'll start recruiting companies to Paducah. Um, and, and Monica and her team has been working with uh, local partners to put the investments together to actually relocate uh, these companies. Companies, uh, we make a non-dilutive seed investment of $50,000 in these companies to help them relocate and then um, provide our programming through the accelerator for 12 months while they're there. So we're excited to, to really launch something that's um, you know, more dedicated to the demand side uh, with the first 50K program very soon. And then lastly, before we pause here for, uh, I think, the Q&A, uh, Monica mentioned that we uh, launched the Innovation Challenge. This is a pre-accelerator program that we're actually um, developing uh, in West Kentucky. Uh, it'll be launched across Southern Missouri in uh, the next year as well. And it really gives us a chance to meet non-technical founders who have great insights and domain expertise about problems that could be solved with software if they only knew how to develop software. And so we um, have gone through the competition. We now have semifinalists that have been identified and they will be participating in a pitch competition this Friday um, to see which companies will move on that we'll be working with over a six month period to develop uh, new software applications with them. Uh, this is a pretty structured program where we're able to provide training and, and coaching that allows even non-technical founders to understand exactly what it is that customers want and need in their software and puts them on a path to develop that um, with the least risk really that you develop a product that might have features or functions in it that customers end up um, not desiring. So we'll, um, we'll share out uh, some of the uh, outcomes of that program soon and you'll start to meet uh, the individuals who'll be going through uh, that program. And so obviously at the end here is uh, contact information for myself and um, Monica, so that uh, as you have follow-up questions or need any assistance, uh, we can certainly uh, provide additional information. Again, I wanna, I wanna just say how, um, how excited we are to work with all of the partners uh, in the community. Uh, obviously, uh, I hadn't spent much time in Paducah, um, uh, prior to, to working uh, with the Sprocket team and starting to really get to understand what makes the community tick over the last couple of years. And we're going to have a uh, tremendous impact there and uh, look forward to working with all of you. Great. I, I'm ready to move into some questions. Um, but Monica and Suzanne, are there things that you all, are there comments you guys want to add? Not for me at this time. That was pretty complete. And I feel like you're probably all very overwhelmed, but <laughs> there's been a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> I will drop the link to the Sprocket newsletter in the chat for everyone. It's a, it's a once a week easy way to kind of keep up with what's going on. So you have access to that. Great. 
Uh, one question and that was on my mind that has been uh, already been answered, but it was in the chat box is about that pitch competition. Uh, Dr. Stapleton, there's a lot of interest in that, but uh, it, it's, is it a closed event, I'm guessing, and others can't really watch it? Yeah, correct. So, so the uh, it'll be a, it'll be live but private uh, pitch competition on Friday. Um, that'll be a consistent theme uh, over the next several years, Sandra. Uh, with the intellectual property that's involved and some of the things going on, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not like the made-for-television Shark Tank where uh, people just share uh, their information. But we will definitely report out. Um, some of the outcomes of uh, the pitch competition and then let you follow along as we work through the development and you start to get a sense of how someone, unlike the first 50K teams, which are teams that have been up and running for one or two or three years sometimes, um, someone in the very early stages, how, how we work with them to develop um, the, their initial prototypes and products and how we engage with customers and that whole learning experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much visualizing it as the Shark Tank approach where they're standing there in front of these judges. I actually watched that show last night, so uh, I think that's fresh on my mind. Um, I want to go back to the um, first 50K. So I know that you're talking about launching that in April. And those companies, that, those were companies that were started somewhere else that moved to, to Cape Girardeau. Correct, and so this would be the goal for that new company to move to Paducah. Correct, um, re really similar to uh, you know industrial development uh, activities that we've all become very used to. Um, Paducah Economic Development always out looking for companies that they can bring to the community that provide jobs. Uh, this is very similar, except those companies just happen to be software uh, development companies and they add tremendous value in everything else that's going on. You start to get an insight of sort of how the pieces work, where now there are several new companies who are going to have technical talent job needs. And so um, the more of those companies we bring, the more of them we build, then the more we have an ability to plug uh, this newly trained talent into not only existing companies like CSI and others, but uh, into these new companies in the community. So what would be the first steps? Uh, I mean, they're going to uh, apply for this first 50K, correct? And then yes. they'll be chosen. Then how long do they have before they're actually expected to be moved to Paducah? So we will have companies in Paducah in October. Okay. It's, so a, you... it's a pretty extensive process. The application process, um, we'll be working with local uh, individuals that make up a competition committee that'll review all the applications. And we've done this many years, so we have a system developed that really helps us organize it. But um, we go into extreme depth of diligence on these individuals and their companies. Um, we will have a pitch day uh, in Paducah, ahead uh, of the uh, selection. We'll have a reception that will uh, be before that pitch day, which will be open to the public and all the teams that are going to be there vying for a chance to move into your community uh, will be there so that you can meet them. They'll do short of abbreviated pitches uh, so you'll get to know them. And then obviously the next day we'll have the private pitch competition um, and, and then we make those selections. Uh, that whole process of recruiting those companies from uh, across the globe actually, we, we have one of the most successful companies in our previous cohort here in Cape is from Ukraine. And so, so we don't just have domestic applications, we'll have international ones as well. Uh, that recruiting process begins in April. Do you expect that to be via Zoom or in person? Uh, well, <laughs> I'll, uh, the timing, but... crystal, crystal ball and see how, see how the world is operating then. Um, we've never had to do it uh, virtually, but we certainly can um, uh, hope, hope by then that um, everything has progressed to a place where we can do that in person. Would you expect that the other, any of the other companies that come here uh, to, I mean, to make their pitch might decide to locate here, even if they aren't selected for the first 50K? Sure, and, and one of the things, Sandra, we work really hard on, um, the $50,000 is, uh, I mean, relatively, it's a lot of money, but in terms of what it takes to build these businesses, it's not a lot. So none of the companies that choose to relocate really do it 
for that purpose. They, they do it because there's a strategic importance in the location. And maybe that's a partner company that exists in West Kentucky or in Central Kentucky. Maybe that's um, you know, a, a large uh, association or something that they wanna be a part of. And oftentimes it's geography. Uh, to be honest with you, um, it's probably one of the things benefiting us since the pandemic. There are a lot of these companies that believed they had to be in metro areas to, to really be successful. And they've learned pretty quickly they don't. They have a desire to kind of get into a slower community where they can really focus on the hard work that it takes to build these companies. And uh, frankly, uh, they can be kind of a big fish in a small pond. The, the companies that come to Cape Girardeau and will come to Paducah, we're going to heap as much effort as we can in helping them be successful. They're not one of a hundred companies that get recruited like in Louisville or, or in St. Louis. And so um, those companies that don't get selected, uh, once we introduce them to the community and the opportunity and some of that strategic uh, sort of uh, opportunities present themselves to them, they absolutely uh, may decide uh, to relocate anyway. So as a community, what could we do uh, to make sure that we're presenting our best uh, impression for them and to make sure that they want to come here? What, what could we do? Yeah, uh, so we're doing a lot of it now. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first thing is you, you really can't attract these companies without the infrastructure in place. And I hate to keep making this, the sort of uh, parallels to industrial econo economic development, but it's like be, being unable to develop an industrial employer without a business park. So, so we really have to have this infrastructure in place, the co-working space, these training programs, the network of individuals who get together and work on these software-based companies. Uh, you, you really have to have that whole system in place. And so the big steps, honestly, where we're taking now, we've, as you know, uh, we've been working on this for a while. The public just uh, got uh, access maybe uh, or exposed more to it uh, recently, but uh, it takes some time to do this. So now that those pieces are in place, um, we're just going to put on a really good face uh, for that reception. Uh, we do a really good job of developing a profile for the community as we go out and start to recruit. Uh, it took us a few years to kind of learn where to find the teams that eventually seem to be a good fit for us. And so um, part of it, frankly, is uh, momentum that we've developed with the competition as well. Founders of these companies all know each other and they network around the country. And the best advocates, frankly, for the program are folks who have been involved in it before. And uh, all of those teams in that uh, cohort that I shared with you a moment ago are interested in having offices in Paducah, for instance. It's a, it's a good retail, uh, a good regional location to sort of expand into uh, out of Cape Girardeau. So we'll, we'll be working with you, um, the chamber and, and the community at large, Sandra, to kind of get prepared for the reception in those days when those teams will be there. You know, I'm visualizing this as uh, how, you know, as an economic development recruitment, when we bring a company in, sometimes they, they're, nobody really knows it, but we're also showcasing our community by where we drive them by, where we, um, the, the strategic stops, the strategic people that we introduce them to. So I'm visualizing, is it similar to that? Sure. Yeah, it absolutely is. And um, we'll also introduce them to uh, some of the companies that are here in Cape Girardeau. Um, you know, one of the things that we had to overcome in the early days was just a, the feeling that um, five, six years ago, you know, there, there wasn't many technical based companies in our communities. So some of the early applicants were, were sort of like asking the question, how do they fit in and who, you know, who, really, who are they going to work with? Uh, well, we don't have that problem now. So uh, we'll also introduce them to the community here. Um, and, and really expose them to uh, the opportunities they'll have to collaborate. And that's, um, honestly, Sandra, that's the big deal for these companies. It's uh, really the founders and the staff that are, are building them in the early days, uh, just being surrounded by other people doing similar work because it, they really feed off of each other. Okay, great. 
I'll, I'll pause for a second if anyone else has some questions that they would like to uh, ask. Otherwise, I could just keep on talking. But <laughs> does anyone else have one? Uh, Sandra, this is Emerson. I have a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Stapleton, how, how many employees of the companies that have come to relocate to Cape Girardeau, how many employees do they have now, uh, rough estimate? Yeah, so um, just in the last uh, two years, Emerson, so if you just take 2019 and 2020, uh, about 45. Not so to mention the, the, the companies that we recruited uh, years prior to that. So those are people that actually moved to Cape Girardeau? Or yeah, some, 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 some that did, some that were local talent that um, were, were able to go to work for those companies as well. Okay, great. I see yeah, Tariq is going to go ahead, Emerson. Sorry, I've got one, one other question. I was going to say it was my last question, but it probably won't be. Um, the, the minimum age to be in a youth coding league, what is that? So the first grade that the program serves is fifth grade. And so we don't really uh, work on age. We work off the grade, grade year that the students are in, but, um, we have a fifth, sixth grade division and then a seventh, eighth grade division as well. I saw Teresa Spann, I see her name on here, and I did see her come on with her camera earlier. I'm probably putting her on the spot, but she's the principal at McNabb Elementary, and I know that they're a part of your Youth Coding League. So, um, Teresa, am I putting you on the spot by just saying a thumbs up uh, to the program, and if you have any stories you would like to share about some of your students? No, we're just super excited to be able to have this program and thankful for our library to provide that for us. And so it has been instrumental um, with our, our students. And even throughout the COVID season, they have been faithful to come. Matter of fact, we're in fourth place in the region right now. So we're excited about it. And then I'm also excited about the possibility um, for their future and um, partnering with the community college or whatever college they uh, plan to attend as well. So it's been been really a win-win, and I'm thinking about how can we get more kids involved in it. Great. Well, you're you're a great um, role model and uh, motivator for that program. So thank you, Teresa. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I really appreciate. It. I, I thought I thought you'd be willing to talk if you would if you oh, could. Yeah. <laughs> you're so passionate about your students and uh, making sure that they're all successful. Uh, I guess I have another question about, uh, there are some schools on here that may not be involved right now in the Youth Coding League. Uh, who, who do they reach out to if they're interested now in having their students become involved with it? Sure. So, Sandra, they, they may already be talking to our program director for Youth Coding League, uh, Stacy Lane. But if not, uh, they could either contact me or Monica or Suzanne, and we'll get them in contact with her. This is the time of year where... Um, you know, deciding about new programs to offer uh, going into the fall. Um, you know, this is the kind of time of year to get that process started. Um, we would certainly be glad to meet with any um, school leadership in the area, talk more about the details uh, of the program. Um, as was mentioned, it, it is sort of a COVID resistant program. It can be delivered uh, virtually and has been for the last year or so. Um, it, it really is amazing to watch uh, unsuspecting young people who uh, have an interest or an intrigue about this thing, coding, and the way that they connect to it. The, the concept from the very beginning uh, provided by uh, my partner, Chris, was to provide the same act, act, um, opportunities for individuals to connect about the sort of technical subjects as athletes have. And so what's also fun to watch is how schools celebrate their success similarly. So in schools uh, that have been doing this a little longer um, over in Southeast Missouri, there are all school assemblies. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to watch young people who are, are winning with their intellect and their academic pursuits um, be rewarded uh, with some of that uh, uh, sort of social uh, stuff that goes on for kids uh, as athletes do. So. Um, we're anxious to get more students and uh, schools uh, signed up and involved. So be happy to reach out and talk to anyone. 
you talked about it being across the country, but I, in the region, would they work through you all? And then I see yes. Monica said, yes, they can work through you and that there is a fee. Do many of them get sponsors to pay for that fee or how does that work? Yeah, it, it varies. Um, some schools, uh, it's a part of, uh, um, it, I would say it's a very inexpensive program relative to others like this, which was by design uh, by us to, to do everything we could to provide it um, as much access to it as possible. Most of the fees involved uh, are really used to provide uh, a stipend to the coach who's a local teacher and then also the materials to students directly. So uh, yeah, some schools um, do work with a local business or a philanthropic organization to provide the fees. Okay, great. So I know Suzanne has put the link in uh, the chat box and I think they're, we're asking for some more information on how for schools to register. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, Monica and Monica says she'd be happy to share that information with everyone. Uh, are there any other questions that anyone else has on the call today? All right, well, I'm just gonna wrap up here with some thank yous. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the McCracken County Library for sponsoring this call today and sponsoring the Youth Coding League. What a great program that is for our youth in our area. I'm so excited about it. So thank you, Sarah. Do you have any comments you would like to make and wrap up? I think I'm unmuted now. Um, Leah, would you like to, Leah works with the Youth Coding League. One of my coworkers is here. Wave at you. I'm going to put Leah on the spot. <laughs> hey, Teresa. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I, um, I have done coding programs here at the library that were similar, and then I was really excited to be able to bring this um, bigger program to Paducah, because I certainly wouldn't be able to do classes at all these schools. Um, it's just it's really great to have the coding programs um, expanded throughout Paducah. So I know in 2017, we started doing some short camps here at the library, spring break, fall break, and over the summer. Um, but there's just no way to get to every location in Paducah um, with library staff. So this was really, really a great opportunity to um, spread that mission. And Sarah, the library is back open now fully. Yes, ma'am. We opened to the public um, some occupancy requirements, but we are open as of March 1st. Great. Thank you so lots much. Of computers, Paula. lots of, um, excuse me, lots of um, computer assistance. It's one of the main places in this area that people search for jobs and get workforce development help. So we're really proud to be part of this. Great, great partner for this, uh, this program. So thank you so much for the sponsorship today and thank being you. a part of this. We really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Stapleton, as always, thank you for joining us. I'm assuming you're in Cape Girardeau today. So we really appreciate the fact, you know, this is one thing that Zoom has allowed us to do is to bring speakers in without you having to travel over here. So thank you for joining us. It's always great to hear you and the passion that you have for these programs. So thank you. Thank you. And Monica and Suzanne, thank you so much for everything that you guys are doing uh, with Sprocket, Grow West, um, all codify everything uh, for innovation programs in our community. So thank you so much for that. And uh, we really appreciate this. This video will be available if there are people that you want to share this with um, at your workplace. Uh, we will. We do have the video. Just email me at swilson at and I'll send it to you. We'll also be posting it on the Paducah Chambers website under BEP. Uh, it might be later today or tomorrow, but we'll get that posted as soon as we can. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, Kevin O'Neill, you put this in the chat box for the public for everyone. So those of you who don't don't know, we might not have been on when I joined it. I said normally we would be having our poppy seed chicken, hash brown casserole, and green beans. So um, maybe the green beans were cold today. Uh, <laughs> food is always critical and always important. So we're missing that in our meetings to the, uh, these days, uh, not having that. I'm sitting here thinking, what are we going to have for lunch now? So thank you all for joining us today. It's been a great program. Uh, we're really appreciative of everything all of you are providing to our community. And I can assure you when you have bring those people in uh, for that first 50k we'll roll out the red carpet for them and make them want just fall in love with Paducah and McCracken County so thank you so much uh, everyone have a great day it's good to see your faces thank you thanks